All right, so um, we're going to continue our discussion of the biological paradigm by talking about brain structure. Um, and we're going to talk about this list here is going to be our focus. And again, we're choosing our focus based on what brain areas I'm anticipating are going to be important to future conversations. Um, and so obviously there's lots of other brain structures and they are also important, but we're not going to emphasize them as much in our conversation. Um, and I just want to um, bear with me a sec. I'm trying that. All right, so I wanted to, I want to show you this website. Um, if you Google 3D Brain, uh, you'll come up with this. It's also an app that you can download for your phone. Um, and I think it's particularly important, uh, useful. Um, so you can on this website kind of turn the brain so you can look through it, and so you can be looking at the whole brain. But this shows you know a transparent half, so you can see into it. Um, and um, on your phone, there's a touch screen that you can change. But what I really like is that you can look at images and information at the same time. Um, and so here, right, one of the things that you and I are going to talk about is, um, I'm going to pop this back up here for a second for you, right, um, is the cerebral cortex. Um, and if you, I'm sorry, guys. Um, there we go. Um, and so here, if we want to look at the cerebral cortex, um, you know, we can um, look here at um, the frontal lobe, which is part of the cerebral cortex, <clears throat> right? And so let's say we want to look at the frontal lobe. Um, it, it shows us here, right, the prefrontal cortex and, um, and all of the cerebral cortex overall. But here we're looking at the prefrontal cortex. We can turn it. So we can see the whole thing with the corpus callosum in between. Um, and then we have here, right, the frontal lobes are part of the cerebral cortex, um, one of the brain's largest structures, um, so-called higher cognition functions, number of important substructures. And so it, we will talk some about some of these, like orbital frontal cortex. Um, and uh, they're involved in attention, thought, voluntary movement, decision making, and language. Um, and you can see how those might be important to thinking about um, mental disorder. And here, right, if we damage it, it tells you what's going to happen. It talks about these substructures. Um, and then what's really cool, if you're interested, right, is they also link to um, peer-reviewed research that touches on these areas. And so um, I think that that can be a particularly useful thing. Um, so I, I would suggest that you download um, this onto your phone um, so you have that available to you. Um, and then if we look at um, you know the basal ganglia, which is the next one we want to look at, which you guys might be a little bit less familiar with. Here we go. Or whatever. There we go. Um, and so the basal ganglia, let me turn this, um, is here um, and uh, embedded um, kind of in the center of the brain. Um, it's a group of structures uh, in, in that regulate the initiation of behavior. Um, and that's what's going to be important to us is that the basal ganglia is about the initiation of behavior. Um, and it, right here we go. The basal ganglia is involved in cognitive and emotional behaviors and play an important role in reward and reinforcement, addictive behaviors, and habit formation. So you can see how important that might be um, in terms of um, in terms of the things that might be related to disorders. Um, in terms of cognitive disorders, the basal ganglia abnormalities have been found in individuals with schizophrenia, may explain habit learning deficits associated with that disorder, also contributes to uh, depression, especially in relation to the limbic system, which we're going to talk about in a moment, right? Um, and so very important um, in those ways. Um, the ventricles, I'm not sure if they even show the ventricles here. Um, let's see if we can get an image of that. They do. Okay. Um, give it a moment here to catch up. Um, it should be showing. There we go. Um, right. And so um, ventricles, yeah, right here. Um, they're fluid-filled spaces, and they become important for us in thinking about damage. Um, and there's some um, there's some 
evidence that people with schizophrenia have enlarged ventricles and that that might also be true for people with bipolar disorder. And so um, it, it also is uh, something that we associate with dementia. And so essentially, the, the larger these fluid filled spaces get, the less brain mass we have. And we know that in some psychological disorders, um, that is happening, uh, although we don't completely understand why that is happening. Um, and then our limbic system. So let's come here, right? The, let's look at the limbic system overall. I'll give it a moment because for whatever the reason, it's there we go. Um, and so we're going to be really interested in the cingulate gyrus, which is this pink that you're seeing here. And you and I are also going to be very interested in the amygdala. Um, and we'll look at those separately in a second. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about the hypothalamus a little bit when we talk about um, the endocrine system. Um, hippocampus is about memory, right, is right here, um, and so tied to those. Um, but let's look specifically at um, cingulate gyrus. Go. Um, and it helps to regulate emotions and pain. And so this is about emotional regulation. Um, it also uh, it, it, uh, um, helps you kind of balance potential reward and potential um, punishment um, and kind of risk benefit analysis so that um, you can decide whether to engage in behaviors or not or to avoid negative consequences. And then the amygdala is about our alarm system. Um, and so we'll wait for this to catch up and show us that little almond. Uh, there we go that little blue almond um, in the limbic system um, and that is about our uh, again about fear and therefore also about learning um, and again about anticipating um, uh, what the risk is for bad outcome if you engage in a behavior people with anxiety disorders have a very active amygdala generally um, and um, what's interesting is children babies who are born um, with a strong startle response often grow up to be anxious children and anxious adults. Um, if we do brain imaging on them, we can see that their amygdalas stay very, very active throughout their lives. Some of them, however, learn coping skills and learn to moderate their behavior um, and their anxious responses, even while their brain is still sending them anxious, anxious signals. Um, and that's an important um, thing to pay attention to, that just because our brain is wanting to send us certain signals doesn't mean we have to forever um, respond to those signals and we can learn through therapy essentially to um, to interpret signals differently or to understand that sometimes our brain is sending us incorrect signals and we might um, behave um, in ways that aren't consistent with those signals so let's go back here um, oh, the brain stem, right, is, I'm back for a second, uh, the brain stem is at the base of our brain, so in a second, this is going to light up for us, there we go, um, right, and here, these are mostly um, immediate life-giving uh, things, um, but it is involved in reflexive behaviors, that there are times um, when, um, they wind up, um, you know, affecting alertness and sleep in ways that are interesting to us, especially with disorders like depression. Uh, so let's come back here and pick up from that current slide. There we go. Um, and think some about the endocrine system. We meant, I pointed out the hypothalamus to you when we were looking at the limbic system. And the endocrine system um, is going to be important to us in lots of ways, but the way that is going to be most interesting to us is this um, long-term stress response. And so our hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenal cortex form the HPA axis. Um, and this is our slow stress response. This is involved with the release of cortisol. Um, and um, we know that people can be primed early in life by stressful experiences so that they may have an HPA system that responds um, differently, that their, their um, body is less good at turning off that response and, keep it, and better at keeping it going. Um, and you can imagine, therefore, how that might tie to research that shows that children who have early difficult experiences may have more um, susceptibility to psychological disorder. And I know, um, especially those of you that are in the DARC program may be very familiar with the idea of ACEs or adverse childhood events. Um, 
and and that is certainly ties directly to this. Um, uh, what I always want to say about that is that that's not a new idea, right? Freud, um, that's what Freud was talking about with us. It's what people who are studying um, this HPA response have been talking about for a long time. Um, and so a little bit that idea of adverse childhood events repackages it um, into um, kind of a, a well, self-report inventory that goes with it and, and kind of a new term to talking about it. But it really does, is consistent with the ways in which we've looked at early childhood and the events that happen in early childhood um, for a very long time. Um, so we're going to pause here and when we pick up, we're going to um, be talking about genetics. And um, I think we'll just do one video with genetics um, and, and then be done. Okay.